Welcome to our presentation on the software stack that won the Forms Student Competition. First of all, I want to thank the reviewers for their valuable feedback. Amongst other points, I think the most common wish was a higher level of detail, and I can fully understand that. Uh, we wanted this too, but the format of a workshop labor limits us to six pages. However, we are talking about turning this into a full size paper and to include your suggestions there. Now let's use this uh, short presentation to provide some images, videos that help understanding our results better. First, as a little introduction again, uh, what is Formula Student actually? Here you can see a waste crack at the Formula Student event in the Czech Republic. So you have um, blue and yellow cones that mark the track boundaries. And the vehicle driving in the background right now has to locate itself on the track recognize the track, plan its path, and complete it as fast as possible without any interaction from outside. The hardware stack that makes this possible, we have the base car, it's an electric orbit drive, about a little, little more than 200 kilograms, 80 kilowatts of power, so quite some potential for acceleration there. We have a LiDAR, optionally combined with three cameras, and other sensors, just, uh, such as IMU, wheel encoders, or an optical ground speak sensors, but there is no GPS, as you might have noticed. That's something we don't need uh, for this scenario. Let's look at the perception pipeline quickly. First of all, we um, need some ego motion and distortion because um, the white lighter rotates at a frequency of 10 Hertz as we use it. And if you don't do some correction, you would have effects such as here on the left-hand side, where actually continuous lines become separated so some simple undistortion is needed. The next step, we perform a ground filtering. It's basically um, based on the principle that if you look away from the car full of the ways of a LiDAR, you take a look at the gradient between consecutive points. If a gradient is too low, then the points are assumed to be in one plane, and then it's, that's considered ground. And only if you have some high gradient, suddenly something rising off the ground, you get it here as marked in green in this picture. The next step um, from this non-crown point to perform some clustering. Um, it's a simple Euclidean clustering. We also tried out a DB scan. And for post-processing, you take the cluster that you had and based on the characteristic of the cones as we know them, their size, their um, how they are in groups usually, you can filter out many, if not all, of the other clusters so that you're only left with the cones. And you can use these cone proposals either directly or you can feed them into the camera image, perform a projection from 3D to 2D, then cut out those uh, small boundary boxes around the cones in the image, send them to a neural network that runs on the Google Coral Edge TPU, a very uh, low power, device with only about four watts, and then classify them as cones, blue, yellow, or here in, the, um, here in black as no cones. Um, here in this image from a drone, you can see the localization mapping as well as the planning live. Um, oh, sorry, no, it's up. Continues, um, you can see the car driving, you can see new cones appearing as they are recognized by the perception system. And the path lambing tries to um, detect the boundaries of the track, the middle line of the track and perform some optimization. More about that in just a second. For the um, slam implementation, it's running on two threads. One is focusing on real-time capability and one for accuracy. For one thing, you use the velocity estimation. So things like um, uh, data from the IMU or the wheel speed sensors combined to publish a short-term pose estimate that is needed for control. Of course, control needs a high-level pose estimate to work. You create post nodes for the graph that is um, using the GTO library. You create automatic, ed automatic edges. And then you take the perception scans as well to perform some data association, meaning you have a map of already um, mapped cones. And we 
try to match the new perception scan with this existing map using a K and N approach, K nearest neighbors. We also tried some more complicated algorithms like joint com compatibility for ancient brown, JCBB, but um, the simple KNN is much faster and turned out to be su sufficient for this case. Um, in the second thread, you fold, um, which is running as fast as it can, but it's still a lot slower than the first thread on the left hand side. You feed these um, poses and edges into a graph, you linearize around the current estimate, and you have an optimi and optimize this graph. So the pose that is at first only made up of velocity estimation is then corrected using the perception scan. And um, for the trajectory part, you take the landmarks as they are, perform a triangulation, Delaunay triangulation with a function bound approach, uh, a divine conquer approach, sorry. Um, perform a path search. So you try to recognize the track boundaries. And from the track boundaries, you can get the middle points of a track, perform a interpolation between these points. And then you get the middle line of the track. The middle line is, of course, for a race car, it's not enough. You want some race line. And we do this using a minimum curvature approach. The, um, the good thing about minimum curvature is that it's quite fast, taking only about 0 0.5 milliseconds. A minimum time approach is also possible, but it's taking far too long, also in the range of many seconds up to a minute, potentially, based on the optimization method. The whole trajectory node, um, so the part on the top here, takes about 20, second, uh, 20 milliseconds to complete. So you can run with a frequency of about 50 Hertz. And for control, I want to give you a little insight into our um, simulation. On the top left side, as the simulation is based in WAS, and visualization is here in Arvis. You can see on the top left, we requested a measured steering angle. As it's a simulation, of course, it's not a measured steering angle, but rather it's filtered if we identify PT2 dynamics and it's provided for Mihil the model in the simulation. We can change some simulate uh, parameters live using dynamic reconfigure. You can see the bottom on the left. On the right hand side, you can see the other simulation with a blue line that is the target trajectory. The green line is the current reference trajectory and the red line is the state prediction from the model predictive control. Uh, for example, if you turn off, um, if you use a PT1, then uh, it's more delay introduced and the steering angle needs to be filled up more. And if you turn off the time delay compensation completely, then you can see here that the car is getting much less stable. And it's really deviating a lot from the target uh, trajectory. And finally, um, the low level control with optimal control allocation torque vectoring is seen in action here. You only build one side of the track because we are twisting a little bit too much. But you can see in the diagram right now how the torques are um, distributed between front and rear differently based on the optimal control. Yep, thank you um, for listening to, to this short presentation. Uh, I hope you will read a paper or have read it already. And yeah, any insight, input, and discussions are welcome later. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, this was a very interesting talk, and congrats for winning. Uh, I know how much work it is to, 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 to work in Formula Student, and um, it's just amazing to see what you guys set up and then bring it in a paper. Thank you very much. Um, we're moving on to the next presentation with um, Ferenc. I make you um, a co-host now. And then you're able to share your screen. Really. So we can see you. Okay. Hi. And we you can, can also hear me, right? We can hear you and you are okay. able to share your screen.
yeah, we can see your screen. Great. Okay. The stage is yours. Okay. So, good, um, good morning and thank you for the opportunity. I'm uh, Ferenc Török and on the behalf of Philip Karle and Maximilian Geislinger from the Technical University of Munich, I'm going to present you today a structured deep neural motion prediction algorithm for an autonomous race car. Uh, to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, first I'm going to give you a short introduction about um, the race for which we developed the algorithm and tell you our main motivation that guided our research. Then I'm going to introduce our method and show you its performance compared to a benchmark model. Um, and finally, I'm going to draw a conclusion and point out some possible directions for future research. The motion prediction algorithm was developed for the race car of the Technical University of Munich for the India Autonomous Challenge. In this competition, the 10 teams were provided with the same dollar race car that you can see on this image and had to develop their own autonomous pipelines. As this race was supposed to be the first fully autonomous wheel to be racing, a performant prediction algorithm was needed to be able to plan and um, race effectively. As autonomous racing is a real life, critical application, the prediction algorithm requisites. First of all, the model has to be flexible enough to be able to model a wide range of racing scenarios. And in the meantime, the method has to be robust to input noise. And most importantly, it has to be able to provide guarantees about the quality of its predictions. It has to be real-time real -time capable and predict on a five seconds long horizon. The accessible information for forecasting is the object history uh, trajectories and the map of the racetrack. In the recent years, um, recurrent neural network based encoder decoder architectures have uh, dominated the field of motion prediction as these networks are very good at modeling distributions in temporal data. However, being deep neural networks, their application in safety critical systems is cumbersome. What we came up with is an encoder decoder neural network architecture that we call MixNet. This utilizes the power of LSTM networks for creating a summary about the current context and then it generates an output trajectory based on this. It takes as input the historical motion trajectories of the objects and the track boundaries around them ahead of them. The main contribution of our work is that based on this summary, we build up the prediction in a structured way, which allows us to give some quality guarantees about the output trajectory. We create the trajectory by first obtaining an intention path, which we then resample according to a velocity profile. We are going to show shortly that these components themselves are built up, built up in a way um, so that guarantees about the overall output can be given. We can think about the trajectories created in this way as the intention of the car, um, intention of the race car, that it would follow if nothing would distract it in doing so. However, if the predicted trajectories of two vehicles collide, that means that this assumption does not hold any longer. And in situations like this, in reality, the quicker car would probably overtake the slower car. Uh, so to model such overtaking behaviors, we adjust the trajectories in a direction that is decided by a fuzzy decision system. This is carried out as a post-processing step. As I've mentioned before, the key of being able to give quality guarantees uh, for our predictions is the way we build up the intention curve as, and, and uh, the velocity profile. The intention curve is created through superpositioning predefined base curves according to weights output by the, by the model. These weights um, sum up to one in every case and our chosen base curves can be seen on this figure. We decided to use the time optimal race line, the truck boundaries and the center line. 
by superpositioning these base curves, a wide variety of typical racing paths can be obtained. The advantage of creating the intention curve like this is that we can guarantee the spatial smoothness of the trajectories and that they will also always lie between the track boundaries. The velocity profile is piecewise linear and is obtained through outputting an initial velocity estimate and five scalar accelerations, one, one for each second on the horizon. Hence, temporal, hence uh, the temporal smoothness of the trajectories is also guaranteed. Predicting the path and the velocity profile separately also opens up the possibility to inject external information into the process. We can use, for example, the filtered velocity estimate of an object to initialize its velocity profile. Now, this is actually what we found the best in our setup. But one could also take a complete velocity profile from a potentially more informed source and resample the intention path according to that. In the figure, you can see some nice smooth uh, prediction trajectories in one of the turns of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. To demonstrate the performance of our model, we compare its accuracy to an unconstrained LSTM encoder decoder network. This model has the same encoder as MixNet, but its decoder is an, another LSTM network that directly outputs the trajectories. We carry out our evaluation on 10 pre recorded highly interactive racing scenarios. These were recorded on our high fidelity hardware in the loop simulator with up to four vehicles at various velocities. Um, if we look at the overall errors, one can see that MixNet, although its prediction set is highly constrained, slightly outperforms the unconstrained model. We would like to emphasize that our main result is that we could reach a comparable, even slightly better accuracy Meanwhile, being able to, uh, to give quality guarantees about the outputs. On the figure, you can see the lateral error distribution on the prediction horizon. This figure proves two things. Firstly, that the error distribution of MixNet almost completely overlaps with that of the unconstrained model. So constraining our prediction set to the family of paths reachable through superpositioning our base curves did not result in a performance degradation in the lateral direction. And um, also this justifies that our choice of base curves is sufficient to model most of the, most of the racing scenarios. But um, this does not explain how we reached a slightly better overall accuracy. And the explanation for this is that with MixNet, it is possible to inject external velocity information into the prediction. And as said, we initialized our velocity profile with the filtered speed, speed of the objects. Uh, this together with the, with the smoothness of the velocity profile resulted in smaller errors in the longitudinal direction, which led to better overall accuracy. And so to highlight it once more, I, our main result is that we can predict just as accurately even slightly more accurately than an unconstrained LSTM encoder decoder. Meanwhile, we can guarantee the smoothness of our output and that it never leaves the track. Um, you can see a, a great example for how important this is in this figure. So to conclude our presentation, we have introduced MixNet, which is a neural network architecture with a highly constrained prediction set. Uh, we have shown that the method is capable of giving some quality guarantees, meanwhile also predicting accurately. And future research direction could include modifying it to predict road traffic uh, or obtaining a method for generalization capability between racetracks. Uh, but it, was all, it would also be worth investigating how one could model interactions between vehicles directly instead of using a post-processing step. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm uh, looking forward to your questions in the Q&A section. All right, friends. Thank you very much. We're moving on to the next talk directly, and I'm making Bo our host. And Bo, you should... Uh,
the host now and can share your screen. Can you hear us? Okay. A second. Uh, hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, you can share your screen oh. and share your camera. Okay. Yes, we can see everything and yeah, you're ready to go. Okay. I show my camera. Yeah, we can see you. Okay. Stage is yours. You can you can start your talk. We we can't, but we can't hear you. You have to speak. Uh, yeah. Now we can hear you. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh. Okay. No, we 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 saw your screen. It was fine. It was fine. Just start oh. talking and present. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Then I start. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bo Jun Xu from National Yangming Jiao Tong University. Today, I'm going to share my research with you. My topic is image-based conditioning for Asian policy smoothness in autonomous miniature car racing with reinforced learning. By defining the rewards for different conditions, we can let the deep reinforced learning agent learn how to get the highest score in on its own. This allows us to find the best racing strategy. However, there are still a lot of problems when applying deep reinforced learning to autonomous racing tasks. Jerky control may cause control inefficiency, damage, and other problems. The video shows the application of deep reinforced learning to the jerky problem on the autonomous racing. And all the problem is seen to real. Since we need a large amount of data for training, it is difficult to train deep reinforced mo learning model directly in real world. One of the common solutions is seen to real. We can use the simulator to sample data for training the model. The trained model cannot adapt to the real world easily because the simulator cannot perfectly simulate the real world. Both the visual gap and the physical property gap may cause difference between the simulator and real world. We apply caps and cycle gain to autonomous miniature car racing to solve jerky control problem and seen to real gap. We compare cycle gain with domain randomization methods. We extend caps to solve jerky control in autonomous racing. And we show that cycle gain and caps outperformance are the methods in terms of finishing lap time and completion rate. Cedar Hurst Mysore proposed conditioning for Asian policy smoothness to smooth the control of the drone with internal state. We extend it to autonomous miniature car racing with image based input. CAPS is constructed with temporal smoothness and spatial smoothness regularization terms. The temporal smoothness term penalizes the agent when the action of the next step is t plus 1, a significant difference from the actions of the current step, st. The spatial smoothness term ensures that the policy takes the similar actions on the similar states, s prong, t, which are drawn from a distribution of wrong states, s. We extend caps to image-based caps with visual input. 
we use image specific randomization instead of just using Gaussian noise and implement six domain randomization methods to generate red similar states as prone. In this work, we implement cycle gain for sin to real transfer, and in our experiments, we will compare cycle gain with other domain randomization methods. We can see that after the conversion of cycle gain, the generated image is closer to the real world image. We use the F110 scale autonomous racing platform that we built ourselves using. NVIDIA JSON Xavier NX with GPU to accelerate the computation of neural networks and using a fish eyes camera, which has a larger field of vision than a normal camera, allows the car to get more information about environments, which may help the car find a better strategy. The following figures are our record of the car's selected actions during the real-world test. We can see that there is significant change with caps compared to the case without caps. The selected actions do not change drastically. We implement two things to real methods, domain randomization and cycle gain, and use them in our experiments. We train the agents in the simulator and directly test in the real world. We can see that cycle gain has a faster speed than domain randomization. By using cycle gain and caps together, we can get the best finish lap time. The video on the left is the result without caps, and the right is the result after using caps. As you can see, compared with the Without caps, the jerky of the model is reduced. In the real world experiment, we found that caps can really help the autonomous racing to increase the speed. So we analyze caps in the simulator. We want to know which component take more impact to the caps performance. We found that caps and or only temporal smoothness can improve the finish lap time without compromising the completion rate. Therefore, the temporal smoothness is more important than spatial smoothness in image-based caps. We can also see that using caps or only temporal smoothness is about 2 seconds faster than before. Since we believe the temporal smoothness is important, we did in experiments to test its sensitivity. We tried different values of the regularization weight of the temporal smoothness term. We got the fastest average finish lifetime on temporal 1.0. So we use 1.0 for the other experiments. We also conduct an ablation study to investigate the influence of the randomization methods on spatial smoothness. In this experiment, we individually remove each randomization method to compare the impact of each method on the spatial smoothness. We found that removing the Gaussian burn caused a drop in performance. We think it may be because when the car is in similar place, they will look similar after burning. So it is more in line with the definition of spatial smoothness. We present image-based caps to smooth the control of autonomous racing. The model that combines image-based caps and cycle gain achieved the best result in real-world testing. This approach reduced the average finish lifetime while improving the completion rate. Since we use image-based, so we can extend our work to solve head-to-head -head or obstacle avoidance problem. 
well, original caps cannot solve this problem with internal state. Uh, thank you for your attention. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for presenting today. And uh, yeah, since our time is moving on, we would move on to our last talks. And now we are leaving the world of, yeah, race cars a little bit and move on to the uh, world of drones. And we welcome uh, Drew from uh, Zurich, which is presenting his work. Cool. Looks like we're good. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Drew Hanover. I'm with the Robotics and Perception Group at University of Zurich, uh, studying under Davide Scaramuzza. Um, first, just a brief slide about me. My entire career has been focused around high performance vehicles and racing. Um, all through my undergrad, I worked for General Motors Performance, uh, Corvette, Camaro, V Series, rear wheel drive performance vehicles. After that, went and worked for Pratt & Miller on IndyCar, NASCAR, et cetera. So this has been my life for a long time. It's really cool to be presenting here today. Um, but I've kind of joined the dark side now with uh, drone racing instead of um, ground vehicles. So speaking of drone racing, we're dealing with you know very fast, nonlinear systems that are immensely difficult to model. Um, we don't really have access to, to wind tunnels or high fidelity CFD simulations to get good information about our, our nonlinear system. And so it kind of begs the question, how do you control such a nonlinear system at the limit when you don't really know that much about it? Um, here in the top, we can see you know, a drone flying with a big uh, water bottle attached or a beer, et cetera, right? And we're trying to you know, be able to adapt to these highly dynamic scenarios where um, maybe we change the system we're using a model-based controller and we still want to have highly robust control performance. You could think of the same thing in a, in a race car where as you're moving throughout the track, you have um, fuel that's being consumed, tires are being degraded the entire time. So your system is, is changing constantly. Um, if you try to go learn a representation of this model uh, during some fixed condition, it's not going to generalize to um, you know, the new vehicle states as, as, your, as your system updates. For us specifically, um, you know, we have very high order aerodynamic effects like prop wash, ground effects, et cetera. Th these things you really can't, can't model. Um, so it begs the question, how do you control a system that you don't know all that much about? So the proposed solution, um, at least the work that, that I'm presenting today is uh, we, we do our best to first model of a first principles based model of the nonlinear system. So we use our knowledge of dynamics and try to build a physics based model. After that, um, instead of trying to go learn some residual dynamics model, like using Gaussian processes or a neural network representation, instead we use kind of an old school adaptive controller um, to basically drive the real plant system towards some reference model that we think the system should behave as. So our, our first principles based model. Um, by doing so, we skip this step entirely of having to do any sort of learning or data gathering, uh, preparation of data sets, training, whatever, right? And we have this extremely computationally efficient um, adaptive law that can compensate for these model changes in real time and instantaneously. Um, so here's a brief look at what our architecture looks like. So um, we're relying on motion capture for this part of the work, but essentially all of this is running on board. We have an EKF doing state estimation, a nonlinear MPC as our model-based controller that's you know, projecting out a second and a half into the future, trying to track some time optimal um, racing trajectory, which is calculated a priori. Um, and then that nonlinear MPC is then cascaded to our adaptive control, which is then trying to drive the system ultimately towards the MPC solution. Um, we know that the model that's embedded within the MPC is not accurate, right? It's, it's an approximation of reality. Um, but what we can do with this adaptive law is actually drive the real world system towards the dynamics specified by the MPC. Um, and again, everything is ran on board in real time. Um, so to go to some uh, just real world experimental results, I won't present any SIM stuff, 
that's boring. We like to do, you know, we're roboticists. We, we need to do stuff on real systems. So um, what we can see, these are um, increasing speed circle trajectories. We have velocity on the x-axis, um, a bunch of different controllers that we're um, evaluating against. What we can see is even without an aerodynamic model attached into our, our MPC, um, so like we'll typically use like a first order drag model to approximate the, the um, linear drag on the system. Even without that, we can still beat pretty much all of the state of the art um, optimal control algorithms that are current with the literature. So Gaussian process based MPC, um, just a non-adaptive MPC, INDI MPC, um, and, and we're you know showing like over a 70% improvement over the state of the art. Um, our computation is about 5x as fast as the Gaussian process based MPCs. Um, next, uh, we have scenarios two and three. The top is we introduce a 450 gram unknown payload. This, the model is not updated in the MPC at all. We just randomly attach this huge payload to the drone. That's over 60% of the nominal drone mass. We force the drone to take off without any, again, any knowledge of this drone um, and track a two meter per second circle trajectory with less than one centimeter RMSE tracking error. A non-adaptive non MPC can barely take off um, and the, the um, tracking error is pretty massive. Uh, additionally, we can introduce external aerodynamic disturbances in the form of fans, um, where we immediately have to compensate for these unknown forces. So this would represent something like flying in the prop wash of an opponent uh, that you're racing against. Uh, next, we can, you know, attach a big wad of tape to it. It's a time varying disturbance. Again, the drone knows nothing about it. It's a hundred gram payload. And we can basically have better RMSE tracking error than state-of-the-art non-adaptive MPCs. And again, the MPC knows nothing about this. There's no knowledge about this. Is that better? Okay, cool. Sorry, guys. Didn't mean to deafen you. Um, and then as our, let's see. As the last uh, test, um, we can fly a highly aggressive racing trajectory. Uh, the speed, top speeds are over 20 meters per second here with linear accelerations of like four and a half Gs. Uh, all of these tests that you've seen are with the same control gains. No model updates have been made. No control gains have been updated. The same controller can do all of these tasks uh, with no updates. And in the top left, you can see what the, the track looks like. And the bottom, you can see the, basically the tracking performance, which is, is state of the art at these speeds. Um, so just kind of to, to wrap up, I know this is a, a quick conversation here. Um, a lot of this work was inspired from uh, Gaussian process-based MPCs, which were deployed on the AMZ uh, driverless racing car from ETH. Um, I wanted to ask the question, like, do we really need to go and actually learn some model or can we use kind of old school control techniques combined with state of the art real time nonlinear MPC? Like where does that get us, right? And the answer is it does pretty pretty well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's worthwhile to do some, some literature review on old school techniques. A lot of these questions that I was asking were, you know, kind of based around like during the space race, how did we, how did we fly to the moon when we knew nothing about hypersonic vehicles? Like you look at the X-15 NASA plane that flew Mach 5, we knew nothing about hypersonic dynamics at all, but we still applied like adaptive control techniques and were able to achieve those missions. So that's kind of the inspiration for this stuff. Um, and, you know, again, same gains we're using for all the experiments, very minimal computational overhead. All of this runs on board a real-time uh, controller for a, a Jetson TX2 is what we're using. Some drawbacks, anytime you cascade an MPC that has constraints, you're losing the guarantees on obeying those constraints. So that's a problem. Um, and the tracking performance on some of the most aggressive trajectories is maybe not as good as INDI MPC, um, which is another cascaded approach. However, you can't really compensate for mass or inertia mismatches in, in those controllers. Um, some of the, the future work might be to actually, you know, update a model in real time using our uncertainty estimate from the adaptation law and actually embed that model within the MPC so that you do have those guarantees. But I think that's all I have today. So thank you for the opportunity. Hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. And I think you raised the exact same question that um, we can plug it in that uh, a lot of people in the community have. 
um, because we see a lot of people applying these Gaussian models, right? And we see they achieve good results. But you raised the exact question, do we really need that? Um, yeah, we're moving on to our last talk in the session. Um, we have again somebody from University of Zurich from David's lab. He will probably introduce himself uh, in a second. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Is it sure? No. Go back. And then share the Yeah. All right. Stage is yours. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so hi, my name is Robert Pinchka. I'm from the University of Zurich as well as, as Drew. Uh, we are from the uh, Robotics and Perception Group of David Escaramuza. And I would like to also uh, talk about drone racing, uh, in, uh, especially about planning for drone racing or minimum time planning for quadrotors. Uh, yeah. So. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, so the motivation for this work, as, as I said, is the drone racing. However, it is also a very good uh, benchmark scenario for uh, search and rescue, uh, where you want to find some survivors after, for example, forest fires as fast as possible. <clears throat> and it, as you can see in the video, uh, there is a, it, it's a drone race where human pilots are piloting the drones with the headset. They see the video from the drone they want to avoid uh, all the collisions and fly as fast as possible uh, through the gates, through the track. And <clears throat> what is the vision of the, of the group is to kind of do it autonomously, to be the human pilots using autonomous uh, drone. Of course, there are a lot of challenges like the vision-based uh, flight, like the planning and of course the control. And for in order to achieve the minimum time flight, you, you must uh, master all of them. And what I'm wanting to show you here is two works that we did, uh, which kind of tackles the mostly the planning and also partly uh, the, the control. Uh, so let me go to a problem statement. There is a lot of math, don't worry. Uh, I just want to say what is the goal. So the goal is to plan or control or fly uh, in a minimum time through the, uh, through the track. Uh, passing all the gates in a given sequence, and of course, uh, use the dynamics of the drone and uh, basically uh, drive it to the maximum performance. <clears throat> so the first approach, as I said, uh, is a sampling-based uh, method uh, that uses a hierarchical, uh, hierarchical scheme where we increase it, increasingly uh, plan for uh, uh, more complex dynamics of a drone. So we firstly plan uh, for uh, simple uh, paths that are passing through the gates in uh, different uh, homotopy classes. And then uh, we continue to uh, planning for a point mass solution, which is a, a limited acceleration. And we kind of uh, guide this uh, planning for the point mass solution uh, using the previously found uh, paths. And uh, later on, uh, we use a sparse stable RRT, which is a sampling based method that we extended for minimum time and also to pass through multiple waypoints or gates, if you wish. And we showed that this uh, method where we sequentially use the hierarchies of, of modeling the, the quadrotor is can be used to plan uh, minimum time uh, trajectories. Also, yeah, okay. Let's move on. Uh, the second method uh, that we tackled or used is a learning based method with the reinforcement learning, where we combine two approaches, which is first of them is a classical path planning. So basically the first uh, hierarchy in the sampling based method together with reinforcement learning. So the first uh, part is the is using uh, probabilistic roadmap method to find uh, this logical path. And then on top of it, uh, there is a reinforcement learning that uh, learns how to fly. So not only the planning, but also the control. So we can later on deploy it in the real world uh, using real quadrotor at its limits. 
uh, yeah, here in the video, you can see uh, kind of the observation what is passed to the reinforcement learning. So it's the full state of the quadrator. It's the next waypoint or the next case, basically, in the drone racing. And the farthest most, uh, farthest uh, collision free point on the guiding path. This kind of uh, model, the, the obstacles there. And we use multi-layer perceptron uh, network and the, the result or the, the action space of the quadrator is the collective trust and uh, body rates. Yes. Uh, so uh, additionally, we had to use uh, what's called, uh, do I raise it here? No. Uh, so a strategy to train it uh, sequentially, uh, we firstly, uh, learn the, the network to fly slowly through the environment, which is better because it kind of uh, tries to, uh, it's easier to avoid the obstacles or pass through the narrow gaps if uh, the if the drone uh, flies slowly. And then in the later stage of the curriculum learning, uh, we use, uh, we remove those constraints on the speed of the flight and we learn minimum time uh, flight. Uh, now moving to the results, uh, here there are some simulated environments we used for comparing uh, the, the, the methods, the two methods that I presented, so which is the forest office and racing uh, environment. Uh, we show that uh, both of the methods kind of uh, outperforms the state of the art, which is mostly the polynomial methods, which are not suitable for minimum time flight because of their inherent smoothness but it also outperforms other methods, for example, the search-based method, uh, and also it's reaching the quality of the time optimal CPC method, which however does not model the obstacles. So therefore it cannot find uh, the results or the, the trajectories for all of the environments. So the sampling-based method outperformed the state-of-the-art by 3.6 uh, or it's 3.6 times faster uh, compared to polynomial method. And uh, the learning based method is even like 3.9 times faster than the polynomial method. Uh, but what is uh, interesting is that the, the sampling based method is only planning and we have to deploy it using MPC tracking, right? And this was shown before for the CPC time optimal method. And we also show it here for the sampling base. But the problem is that the MPC is uh, kind of obstacle blind. So it, if it cuts the corners in order to increase the speed or to keep the track with the, with the plan, it uh, can collide. We show that this on these scenarios, we achieve only 40% success rate of flying without collision, while the RL kind of learns where are the possible collisions. And even though it kind of deviates from the optimal policy, it still can avoid the, the collision. And in these scenarios, it achieved 100% uh, success rate. Uh, and here in the videos, you can see, uh, you can see on the on the left, you can see the sampling based method together with the MPC, which I will also present this this work here on uh, in ICRA uh, on Tuesday. And uh, on the right, uh, you can see the reinforcement learning, which is much more, I would say, acrobatic flight which would not be possible with the classical sampling based planning plus MPC because there is a, yeah, the just large deviation from the accelerations would immediately collide basically. So <clears throat> this is it. Uh, I thank you for your attention and would like to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we're running a little bit behind, so I would just allow one or two questions. So if you have questions for all our contributed papers, just step um, before uh, um, and yeah, ask the question. If you have some, and we we'll just ask, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Two. Yeah, we'll yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. I really like it. I also work with drones, so I am familiar with it. I have a question for the last talk. I, I really found it interesting. Um, clear, there is a clear bottleneck for the sampling based methods, right? It, because you are limiting the accelerations as a point. So if you would embed somehow not the acceleration limits, but the trust commands 
into that method, then you would expect to be closer to the RL results. So there are three hierarchies, right? So the second one, is, as you said, is the point mass model with, uh, with limited acceleration norm. But the last one is actually using the full quadrotor model, which limits the, the motor thrust, individual motor thrust. So this one kind of should model correctly the, the full actuation of the platform. But of course, there are some like other like aerodynamic effects that are not modeled also. Yeah, so it, it's still kind of, there is a mismatch between the control part, right? And the planning, which we take. And the last, let's say the last part, which has got the thrust limits, that one is blind, as you said. That one is no, blind. no. That one is not. That one is like the planning part that that no has the full, full model. It's not blind. It knows the environment. So we we assume we know the environment actually, but the control part that, that tracks the plan is, is is collision blind, right? Because like state of the art MPC methods that we that we saw uh, are not capable of flying that fast while modeling the obstacles actually or they can model the obstacles but like spherical simple obstacles like no low number of those mm -hmm. okay. and there is no way of just tracking the thrust command jibbit from the last stage rolling yeah it we is it is but mpc okay. tries to cut the corners and if the corner is uh, is okay. obstacle then it's broken. i see this is the discussion we have in the lunch then and then we argue <laughs> all right uh do you have an another question from the audience here because if not, um, yeah, we will answer the question online. Okay, thank you very much for all the contributed paper session.